Okay, welcome to Chapter 16, Part 2. You guys remember, Chapter 16 is called the World Economy. And we're talking about a world economy truly for the first time in this time period, 1450 to 1750, um, because this is the first time in history that we've got the Americas involved in the econ world economy. And also, we're going to see an increase in African in engagement in the world economy. Okay, so we la stopped last time. I was talking about um, India, um, but and we said that it's not as dependent as uh, Latin America because Europeans don't dominate it. Now, does that mean the Portuguese and the British and the French and the Dutch will be involved in India? Yes, they are, but it's not till after 1750 that things really pick up. Okay, now back to the Americas, Panama. Uh, is the place where we see our first permanent settlement in 1509. They were con they conquered Pizarro conquered the Incan Empire, um, but with a relatively small force. Like a lot of these conquerors, he's helped by iron and diseases. An interesting story here about Pizarro. He comes down out of here of Panama, down along the west coast of South America, and conquers the Incan Empire. He does it in part by taking uh, captive the Sapa Inca. This is supposed to be a, a drawing of that incident. Um, not, not historically accurate, but um, anyway, the Sapa Inca. You guys remember last year, Sapa Inca means son of the sun god. So for the Incas, this guy is not just a ruler, but he is also a god or at least semi-divine, semi-divine. And so they take him. Now the story goes that what happens is that the Pizarro says to the people, I've captured your king, and you can have your king back. I'm going to take and draw a line around this room, and if you can fill this room up with gold, I'll give you your ruler back. The he draws the line, the people fill the room up, and Pizarro... Well, if you paid attention to the last slide, you know he had him executed. Why do such a thing? Well, it's kind of easy to see. I mean, maybe not that easy, but kind of easy to see in that think of what the message is you send to the people, to the Incas. I have taken your king captive. You see him as godlike, and I have the power to capture him and kill him. So Pizarro got the gold and got control of the empire. All right, so what were some uh, differences between the British and French North America versus uh, South America? Well, other than in Latin America, what we're going to call in here Latin America, other than the southern Atlantic coast, they were not large manors. Um, most of these places build homes that look very much like what they did back in Europe. Um, they want to emulate what they did in Europe. Europeans, uh, British, and French living particularly north of, say, Virginia, um, and even in parts of Virginia, uh, will emulate very much what had been going on back home. Um, they live closer to European uh, patterns of life. Um, that's over here. They'll build homes, villages that look very much like what they would have left back in Europe, which makes some sense. You know, you want to be like you were at home. Uh, they will develop a merchant class and manufacturing. Now, this merchant class is really what we call the cottage industry, C-O-T-T-A-G, cottage industry. Um, now, the cottage industry is also, um, as it's called up here, you see I'm showing it with the mouse, the putting out system. What that meant is Merchants came around and would develop and would drop off cloth for people to sew in their homes, and they would do all the work in their homes. Then the merchant would come back; they would sell it to the merchant and make a profit. So people lived at home, worked at home, and everything happened out of your cottage, out of your your house. You didn't leave to go to a factory, and um, they did not mingle with native populations. A big, 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 big difference. Okay, now you remember that chart I gave you earlier with mestizos on it? We're going to talk about mestizos more. 
but mestizos were a mixture of Amerindian and Europeans when they copulated and had children. That does not go on in North America. Now, do they have interaction with the Native Americans, the Amerindians? Yes. Do they learn off the Amerindians? Yes. Will they marry Amerindians? Almost never. Very, very rarely, at least as compared to Latin America. There's much fewer, many fewer um, couples. They're, both places look down upon the Amerindians. It's even more intense up here in British and French North America. There are exceptions. There are exceptions, of course, but in general, that's the rule of thumb. Okay, uh, what are some things, three things they bring over from, from Europe? Um, they'll develop similar family patterns. By that, I mean they'll live the same way, have, treat their children the same way. They'll have child-centered families. Excuse me. <coughs> um, you're, one of the things you're going to learn about when we look at Europe in this time period in an upcoming chapter is that people are having smaller families. And as they have smaller families, they dote on the children more. They pay more attention and, and do it. They adopt Western political and economic goals and ideas. That's why you see something like the House of Burgesses here in Virginia in Williamsburg. If you've been to Williamsburg, you may have toured the House of Burgesses. But the House of Burgesses was copied off the British Parliament, the British style of Parliament. And it was, um, it, a Burgess is essentially like a county. So representatives from each county would come to Williamsburg and engage in state actions, state laws, ordinances, these kinds of things. All right, next up, how did Europeans settle when they went to Africa? Well, the bottom line is they didn't do much of it at all. Uh, essentially, they remained in small coastal fortifications, um, what your book calls factories. Um, they will remain in the factories. The exceptions were Angola, where you had a large slave. Now, at this point, Angola, they're probably meaning more, a little further north than modern-day Angola. Um, because this is where the slave trade is going to be. Now think about it a second. The slave trade is going to be from up here around the Niger River all the way down to about modern day Angola. They stay out of South Africa and they stay out of up here. Now they're not taking slaves out of up here where I'm running the mouse across right now. And you guys can guess why, right? I mean, what is that there? That's right. It's the Sahara Desert. And if it's the Sahara Desert, there just aren't that many people. So essentially the slaves come out of here in this West African part. Angola will be an exception. Now slave trade is going to be big here. Um, you can see that we've got the slave trade in Africa. You've already read an article on it um, and it was very much an sl active slave trade going on in West Africa already and then the Europeans tap into that and get actively engaged in that uh, slave trade. Okay, And the other place they will settle in a few numbers is down here at the Cape Colony, right there, that little orange thing right down at the Cape of Good Hope, right here on the southern tip of Africa, where I got the mouse right now. The Dutch will be the first ones to settle there, and then eventually it will fall into the English hands. Uh, we'll talk more about that as time goes on. But they uh, essentially need a refueling station. Um, you can see this. This is supposed to be an early drawing of the harbor there at the Cape of Good Hope. It was a good harbor, and they would come in there. Um, why come there? Because think of it, guys. The Europeans, particularly the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch, and then a little later the English and the French, but the Portuguese and the Dutch and the Spanish and the English will sail down here around Africa to India and over here to the Spice Islands. Okay, well that's a long journey. So at some point you need to get fresh water, you need to get fresh food, and you need to get off the boat for a little while. So this was a good spot, smooth harbor. Much nicer than over here at Cape Horn where I'm pointing right now. Uh, Cape Horn was rough and dangerous. Okay. All right, so what was the impact upon Western Europe? What were 
five impacts upon Western Europe of this. Well, the first one is hostility increased among European states. Um, the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese down here have been the first ones out. The French and the British and the Dutch and uh, up here. We'll get into the game later on, and everybody's competing for colonies. Everybody's competing to stop each other's ships at sea, to control trade between themselves and colonies. British want to trade with Spanish colonies. The Spanish don't because of mercantilism. Remember that policy I mentioned to you yesterday? They will oppose that, and they don't want that. So there's a lot of, a lot of competition, a lot of conflict here. Uh, sugar use increase. Once it's discovered that the Caribbean and parts of Brazil and northern South Africa, or South Africa, I'm sorry, South America, let me apologize for that, northern South America are great for growing sugar. Um, the availability for sugar and the demand for sugar increases significantly in Europe. Up until this point, they've used honey, but now they can use sugar, and it's popular, and it leads to an incredible increase in slavery in this part of the world. Salt's available. There's an increase in wealth from trade and from the increase in the cottage industry or the putting out industry, which I mentioned just a couple minutes ago. Remember the cottage industry where you would get raw materials and you might produce the cloth or the clothing and sell it back to the merchant and he would um, then sell it himself. Okay. All right, that wraps this up. Thank you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow in class.